Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Richard Johansson. I am the Data Visualization Specialist for the Research and Data Services at the University of Cincinnati Libraries. It's a mouthful. Um, thank you again for coming to this presentation today. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Maina Setiana Rundle. Is that close? Maybe. Um, she is the Director of Undergraduate Studies and Associate Professor of the Practice in the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University, as well as a professional educator at our studio. Um, her work focuses on innovation and statistics pedagogy with an emphasis on computation, reproducible research, open source education, and student-centered learning. Um, she's also the author of three open source introductory statistics textbooks as part of the Open Intro Project and teaches the popular statistics with R uh, MOOC on Coursera. Um, with that being said, I'd like to turn it over for the first part of today's lecture. Um, please stay for lunch and the workshop at noon. Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you and thanks for having me. It's great to be out here. So in the first part of today's um, talks, I will be talking a little bit about reproducibility um, and I'll kind of qualify what I mean by reproducibility along the way as well. So I don't know if you can uh, kind of make out what this picture is that's pixelated in the background, but the original um, title slide that I chose for this was this because I think this is how I feel when the results in table one don't seem to correspond to those in figure two. And it happens. Um, if you don't have the right workflow, this is a very easy situation to find yourself in. Or somebody gives you supposedly their data that they use to kind of build their analysis and their paper off of and there's simply no way of getting to the answer. I'll give a somewhat anecdotal example here. I used to um, more regularly teach our uh, consulting course in our department. Um, this is a grad undergrad course and one of the um, themes in this course is reproducibility. And um, so what we did is we wanted to actually reproduce a paper. And the paper we wanted to reproduce was the way by, uh, you know, in which I came upon this paper was completely through my friends. I have a friend who fosters Great Danes, and I don't, does anyone have a Great Dane? Does anyone know anything about Great Danes? They're these like majestic creatures that humans bred over the years to be incredibly fragile, and they don't live very long, and they're huge. And apparently, in the Great Dane community, there is a big like debate over whether their food bowls should be elevated or on the floor because they're really big animals. So when they you know bend over and actually kind of like drink water off the floor, does it actually create bloat, which could be harmful for their health? And apparently there is one paper in literature that says that no, their food bowls should not be elevated and everyone else believes that yes, their food bowls should be elevated. And my friend asked me this question from a scientific perspective, do you think this paper is good? And as a statistician, the way I know whether a paper is good or not is to try to reproduce the analysis first and try to figure out exactly what they did so I can actually say, yeah, in my scientific opinion, as a statistician, I agree with the methods they used or I disagree with the methods they used. We spent over about four weeks on reproducing this paper Nada. We couldn't even match the sample size. And in fact, I had access to one of the main authors on the paper. I didn't have access to whatever version of the data they had because they hadn't really maintained it. I think it had moved with a postdoc to Canada or something like that. So we got some version of the data. And we had some, it was published about uh, 20 years ago at this point, and we simply could not even match the actual numbers. Now, we were able to get a sense of effect sizes, and still, you know, you, it doesn't mean it was a complete waste of time. We learned a lot out of it. But you would think that if you have some papers and figures in your paper, and you have the source data, people should be able to get to those, especially if they're willing to uh, spend the time. And that's not always possible with um, published um, articles. In that case, we didn't have the code. What if you give somebody the code? Can you actually make sure that the results in table one then actually match those in figure two? It's still iffy. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can actually achieve that goal, which seems like such 
a kind of like should be such a standard should really be not um, difficult to achieve but turns out is really not that easy if you're not in the right mindset to begin with but if you actually use a few computational tools that can help you this can be a very a much easier goal to achieve I'm not going to say it's very easy but it can be a much easier goal to achieve so these are just some random numbers that I'm throwing out. I'm going to throw out some numbers, but these particular random numbers was, were generated with this code. So if you wanted to reproduce these slides, you would want to set a seed. So that's the first point that I'm going to make. That if you have any sort of randomization in your analysis, any sort of simulations, this is kind of reproducibility 101. You want to make sure that you set some sort of a seed so the next round of people reproducing your code can actually do that. Um, we're going to be talking about R later. I don't know how um, how much involved y'all are with um, kind of how R is developed, but one of the things that R core developers actually, you know, really, really um, want to ensure is backwards compatibility, but I believe with the next version of R that's coming out, they have caught an error in how the sampling is done and are fixing it, which means that even if you have set a seed prior to that date, you may not be able to reproduce things, unless you take precaution, of course. I mean, I'm sure there will be some documentation around how you can get there. But, you know, even this is not necessarily foolproof. And at that point, I think the decision was, well, should we be doing what is correct scientifically, or should we just go for backwards compatibility? And I believe the decision was made to actually correct the mistake, which might actually change the reproducibility of the results. So, here are the numbers that I want to talk about. 70 is more than 70% of um, scientists who were um, surveyed by Nature ha said that they have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. 50, that is more than 50% said they have tried to tried and failed to reproduce their own experiments. So this was a survey that Nature did in 2016, or at least they published the results in 2016. I can't remember exactly if it was that year or the previous year that they ran the survey, um, on 1,500 scientists that they surveyed. Those are really, really high numbers. 152 is, this is the number of results Google Scholar yields um, containing the term reproducibility crisis just in 2019, okay? So is the crisis there? Yeah, and people are talking about it and writing about it. And 1992 was the earliest reference that I could find to the term um, reproducible, uh, reproducibility in research. So we're going to kind of take a historical view initially and then come to today and see you know, how we can achieve reproducibility. So this is, the, uh, this is a paper from 1992 um, called Electronic Documents Give Reproducible Research a New Meaning. And I'm going to show you a, an excerpt from it. So what they said is that in 1990 they set this sequence of goals. Learn how to merge a publication with its underlying computational analysis. Teach researchers how to prepare a document in a form where they themselves can reproduce their own results. Learn how to leave finished work in a condition where coworkers can reproduce the results. Prepare a complete copy of our local software environment. We're still battling with that. Um, so that graduating students can take their work away with them to other sites. Merge electronic documents written by multiple authors. And export electronic documents to numerous other sites so they can readily reproduce a substantial portion of the research. This was a group of researchers at Stanford said that they actually said they, in 1990, they set these sequence of goals and they have achieved them. And what they said is that now that we have begun using CD-ROM publication, <laughs> we can go much further. Every figure caption contains a publish button that jumps to the appropriate science directory and initiates a figure rebuild command and then displays the figure, possibly as a movie or interactive program. What do we think about this? We're way beyond CD-ROM publications at this point, but that still sounds a little bit space agey if you think about how journal articles look nowadays. So this was a document. Oh, come on, cooperate. Just a second. 
This was a document, uh, this was a, a study that was published in um, 2018. It just like actually kind of is just coming live in 2019. And the news says pioneering live code article allows scientists to play with each other's results. So actually what you can do in this, this is the first of its kind published article where you can actually click on this R script button and recreate that figure. So that it was the goal they set in 1990 and we have just achieved that it seems like with a single article kind of as a prototype so for now. But what that shows is that this may be doable. Um, now obviously if we start picking it apart as to what sort of data were they using, what was the size of it, perhaps in that discipline it's a bit easier than other disciplines, what about how do we deal with private data, there's a lot of but buts that we can come up with but I think it's really really nice to see finally even if it's about 20 years later that this is achievable and I think the computational infrastructure is out there to achieve it um, but there's still more work that needs to be done in this um, domain. So before we talk more about reproducibility, I want to set the stage because I use the term reproducibility especially when mentioning the results from the Nature article uh, where, pe where people said um, we may that they haven't been able to reproduce their own experiments, for example. And there's something different about being able to replicate and reproduce uh, scientific results. So let's take a look at this. The difference between replicability and reproducibility, as I'd like to define it here, is that in, in both accounts we're talking about the same research question and the goal is to get the same results, but in the replicability we're working with new data. So there is a study out there that shows a particular relationship. Can we replicate those results in a new population, in a new sample, so that we can build trust in those findings? That is what I would file under, under replicability. Reproducibility on the other hand is you have the same data set, can you get to those same results one more time? And this is the aspect of uh, reproducibility that I'm going to be talking about that is possible to deal with computational approaches. Obviously the same, some of the same approaches will apply here because if people are going to be doing an analysis based on new data, they still need to be able to see the type of analysis you've done and it should be well documented, but the issue of being able to replicate an experiment and statistical considerations around it, especially if you've heard about the uh, recent discussions around the usage or the abuse at this point of p-values in reporting um, kind of scientific findings, that is not what we're talking about today. That is what I would file under replicability. Incredibly important topic, but a slightly different topic and requires a slightly different methodology to be able to um, solve. If you are interested in the replicability, I would recommend reading the, uh, these two papers. One of them is titled, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, and the other one is the American Statistical Association Statement on P-Values. Not only are they nice, kind of shorter, so even if you're not a statistician, they are uh, well worth read, and they also have additional uh, kind of links out to literature in that domain that I think is incredibly fascinating. So. Let's give a quick example here. I'm going to do a very, I'm going to walk you through a very, very simple data analysis. And I want you to keep in mind that it is in fact a simple data analysis. So what we have here is if you all have done any sort of like work in R, you might be familiar with this data set. It's the famous iris data set from Fisher's irises. So the regression output for predicting uh, petal length from uh, sepal width, okay? I have run a regression and I have my estimates here and this is basically the picture that I'm showing is the relationship between the two of them. Do you see any issues here? The estimate is negative. The estimate is negative. And the slope is positive. The po slope is positive. So that negative 1.74 should be corresponding to this number. And, but I have a positive slope. So clearly I messed up somewhere in my reporting. 
Now you might be thinking, come on Mina, you just made a silly mistake, but actually this could very well be an honest mistake. How would one end up here? So for example, I start writing my report, right? And at some point I said, I'm going to fit a model and print my model summary. And that's that model summary that we've seen earlier, all right? Then I'm going to continue writing my report, maybe somewhere in like Word or Google Docs where I'm getting the results in R and then copying and pasting them here. And here is actually the picture that should go along with it, okay? Then I look at this and I'm like, is this a good model to fit? I mean, we clearly have these two species that seem to be behaving similarly. And then this thir third species here, that's clearly different. Maybe I want to do a little bit of subgroup analysis. Maybe I believe that these should be analyzed separately than these. So I say, okay, let me quickly see what the model results would look like if I actually omitted the Setosa species and just worked with the other two. Then I go ahead and do my filtering, and I copy and paste my results, and I look at this and I say, yeah, I think that's the model I want to be talking about. I'll just mention somewhere in my paper that I removed one group because they seem to be behaving differently, and this is my analysis. Now imagine this was an a lot more complicated analysis. Now imagine there was more than four lines of text here, but pages apart, right? That becomes a lot harder to catch this very simple mistake with the human eye. Now you're counting on me being organized and going back and making sure that I've copied and pasted the correct figures for the correct regression output that I had copied and pasted earlier. And inevitably humans make mistakes along the way. Maybe it gets caught in a round of review and maybe it doesn't. So what we want to be thinking about is how do we work so that this doesn't happen or at least this is a lot less likely to happen so it doesn't depend on a human remembering to do things. It doesn't depend on a human in the height of their analysis thinking, yeah, this is exactly what I was looking for. I'm feeling happy with my results. Let me keep going and run the rest of the models. But instead thinking, oh, let me make sure I go back and fix the other thing I copied and pasted earlier. All right, so how do we make research reproducible? Um, this is a quote from David Donahoe, um, who is paraphrasing another um, um, scientist here, saying, an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself, it is merely advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment and the complete set of instructions which generated the figures. Imagine the blood, sweat, and tears that actually goes into generating a paper and then, I don't know, the 10-page thing you get to submit to a journal, right? So that's clearly not telling the whole story. So the actual science is in that entire research compendium. So how do we make our research available and accessible? We want to make sure that we keep our data raw. We want to make sure that our code and documentation to uh, reproduce the analysis are available. And we also want to make sure that the specifications of the computational environment that you're using are available as well. We need all three of these things and missing any one of them is not sufficient. So we're going to talk about what are some things that you can do along the way to make this possible. Um, a quote, quote from Keith Baggerly um, is, the most important tool is the mindset when starting that the end product will be reproducible. This is always something I try to keep in mind because it's, it's at the beginning of a project when you're thinking, you know what, I'm just going to start like scra scrambling here. I'm going to open a little notebook here and do a few things over there, take a few notes, but not necessarily get organized from the beginning. And at some point, you might lose the thread. The idea is how do you actually train yourself, train the people that you work with, that from the beginning you work in a reproducible workflow so that it doesn't become this thing that you have to do at the end because nobody wants to go back and parse through their files at the end. In fact, that would be a very frustrating experience and not necessarily one that you're going to get rewarded for your time for at the end either. So. Imagine that this is kind of the um, entire range of reproducibility that we're talking about. 
At the bottom of it, nobody, not even yourself, can recreate any part of your analysis. That would suck. We don't want that for sure. And at the other end, we have like push button reproducibility in published work. It's almost like you go to a journal article and you push a button and you can do the whole thing over again. Maybe that's the goal. Well, that's probably quite hard to achieve. So what I want to encourage you to do is like, how do I get close to there? How can I learn to be happy kind of around here somewhere, even if this just feels like maybe stretching things a bit much, um, either not technically feasible or for other reasons not possible to achieve? The idea is to try to stay as far away from this end of the spectrum as possible. So there is no one-size-fits-all solution for computational reproducibility, though. So I want to kind of keep that in mind. But the following um, eight things that I'm going to talk about might help. So there are eight principles that we're going to go through. This is not a complete set per se, but I think this is a achievable and a widely attainable set, uh, regardless of the discipline that you're coming from. Number one is organize your project. So pick an organization scheme that actually works for you and stick to it and actually pick one that you can replicate across um, various projects as well. What might that look like? So if the level of organization is somewhere between this on your desktop to Marie Kondo, <laughs> you know, you want to kind of live not all the way out there perhaps, but somewhere out there where somebody can come into your house and figure out where things are. I don't know if you've seen the show uh, where you like get rid of things that don't give you joy. Get rid of files that you don't actually use in your analysis. Don't keep them there or label them saying that they're not used so that if somebody else takes over your project, they have a pretty good sense of where things are and where they can pick things up. Um, this could look like this. For a simple analysis, you might have a folder for your raw data that you are not allowed to touch. Nobody is allowed to touch. The only time you touch that folder is when you drop that one data file in there, and that's kind of it. In fact, a recommendation often given is maybe you can lock that file to editing so it is not possible to actually change anything in there. Um, then your process data lives in another folder. So what that is, is there, you, ha you run some scripts perhaps, or you embed it directly in your manuscript, um, the, how you kind of go from your raw data to your process data. But that step is probably not something you want to redo over and over. So you save this interim stage of the process data. And then you pe perhaps pick up on your modeling or your visualization from the process stage. Your manuscript is hopefully an R markdown document if you're living in an, the R world, or something similar if you code in something else. The idea being that you're using literate programming so that your prose and your code are actually all in one place, and they're impossible to pull apart. For a more complex analysis, that structure may not be enough. You may not necessarily want to have a single um, our markdown document that actually has all of your code, perhaps because there are considerations about the size of your data and how long it takes for your code to run. In that case, in addition to the raw data and the process data, perhaps you want to have a scripts folder where you actually save your scripts that take you from raw to process data and from process data to your figures or model results. And your manuscript is still in our markdown document that maybe calls these scripts or maybe only calls the results of those scripts, maybe only calls the figures that you have saved. But at least it is in one place and it gives you some idea of in which order to run through those scripts. Your script should also be labeled in a way such that it actually tells you in which order to run things. So one of the things that I would recommend is if there are conventions in the field that you work in, try to stick with those conventions because that's going to make collaboration easier. That's going to potentially make working with new students easier. And also, there's probably no need to reinvent the wheel that you can actually stick to a norm that exists. There are some R packages out there that actually start to you with a kind of a project skeleton like this. Uh, I think similar things exist in other domains as well. If there there is one that works for you, pick it and stick to it. And I think the important thing is that you stick to it from project to project. So at least you, when you look at your project folder, have a really, really good idea where you had left things off. 
Number two, use readmes liberally, like very liberally. <laughs> Imagine you won't remember anything tomorrow. Um, so suppose that that raw data f uh, folder has a bunch of CSV files in it, which are your raw data files. Put a readme in there, and maybe that readme looks reads something like this. It tells you what is in here. It tells you where you got those data from. That could be an email someone sent to you. It could be a place where you downloaded that from. So some citation of where it came from so you can track it down if need be and also some idea of what those files are. Remember that the idea is to hopefully never open files like this in a program like Excel that could actually like accidentally alter things in there. Um, the goal is to leave them completely untouched and only interact with them through your code. But you know what? Maybe you just want to figure out what was in airports.csv and you don't want to launch your whole project and run some code. So some notes here will be incredibly helpful. And again, these are going to be almost obvious to you at the moment that you're working on this project. But I think there's a saying, um, the person you're most likely to collaborate with is yourself and you don't respond to emails, <laughs> right? So it's sometimes you simply can't remember if you put down a project and come back to it two months later what you were working on. So these will be incredibly helpful. Number three, keep your data tidy and machine readable. So what do we mean by this? Let's take a look at this data set. So one of the things where I work with kind of like raw data and sometimes actually end up touching that raw data file or at least downloading it from places and manually playing with it is when I have my professor hat on and I'm doing like grade book stuff, okay? I download a roster from our learning management system and then I put kind of like grades and stuff. This is a hand-entered data set. I probably take notes about students. I maybe want to know their major. So it is very likely that my spreadsheet, you know, after midterm two at 2 a.m. looks something like this, where I have some notes for myself and I want to make sure I'm keeping them together. This is not a very good way of maintaining your data though. So what's happening here is, in addition to the, um, kind of numerical data that I have on the exam grades, I'm using coloring to actually mark some students to say low participation. Maybe that's going to be informative for me, for my grading, and I like visually seeing it that way. That's not a good way of maintaining things if you're going to be accessing these data in any sort of programmatic way later. So you probably want to change it into something like this, where participation now becomes another column and all those students who were marked as low participation are actually marked as low in, the, uh, in that uh, column as well. In fact, I'm seeing a typo. I'd probably want to make sure the case of this matches those as well. Um, as you can see, I had some things like somebody missed an exam, somebody's sick, there's a dot here. These are all NAs ultimately, and they're not going to change how I grade them or how I calculate anything for them. So again, I actually enter in things that R, which is the language I'm using, is going to be able to read and that I can process through. This basically means that I'm uh, kind of recoding things such that when I go back, I don't need to remember what what would, what would require human interaction kind of to read through that worksheet. Number four, comment your code. This seems quite obvious, but I think that it's also important to think about what is a good way to comment your code. So your comments should be about, not just about what happened, because Maybe you're doing something like super smart in your code where it's important to know what happened, but chances are I can come back to this at any point and figure out what that code is doing. I know how to read ggplot2 code, so I know that I am plotting some points and then a smooth curve over it. The thing that really needs commenting here is this number. Why did I use this smoothing parameter? Why 0.375? How did I decide that was the right number to pick? Because that is a user 
kind of define value that I probably played around with and then ultimately settled on. The comment should definitely address what happened there. This is important if you're doing any sort of analysis where you're setting parameters ahead of time and you're making some assumptions about distributions. It's the why that needs to be commented more so than the what. I see a lot of code comments where there's a narrative about what's happening in the code. And I don't think that's necessarily as useful and in fact at times might be kind of cumbersome for you because it probably feels like you're writing the same thing twice. But the why is going to be a lot less extensive perhaps but more important for coming back to your work. Um, another one is use literate programming. So what do I mean by literate programming? So this is an R Markdown document where you can see that it starts with a YAML on top and that basically has some metadata about um, the document. So it has a title, it tells me something about the, um, the author. I have some R code online for there that says whenever I knit it, it updates it to the system date. So I have a good record of when is the last time I ran this document. I have some pros, so lines 21 and 22, for example, are things you could otherwise have in a Google Doc or a Word document or a LaTeX file as well. But lines 24 to 27 actually are things that are our code and are defined as such. So when I knit this document, what I'm going to get is a document that looks like this. It is human readable and the code and the output are inseparable from each other. So I'm not doing any sort of copying and pasting of figures or results. I am actually creating everything in one place and with the push of a button getting this output. This is the type of output I probably share with a collaborator who also codes, with a graduate student who is working with me, with an undergraduate student who is working with me. It is not the kind of output that I would share with a collaborator who is not interested in the R code or something that I would submit to a journal. This is what it would be. And the only difference in getting only the pros and the output that I want and hiding and also showing the code is simply one setting in here. So I never remove the code from the underlying source document that's always there. So the document is always fully reproducible but I can hide it away depending on my audience. And the nice thing here is that you get to go back and forth pretty easily in a way that you wouldn't get to if you styled this document by copying and pasting into a traditional text editor. Number six is use version control and I wish I had some special magic trick that would teach you version control in the limited amount of time we have in this hour and I don't. That is not true, but I will say one thing that um, I think version control tends to be one of these things where it seems in my experience that um, Going, going from you know using maybe a Word document to create manuscripts to an R Markdown file isn't a huge jump for people. Like that literal programming step seems to be perhaps doable, but once we get into version control, we tend to lose people a bit more. And I think the biggest reason for that is. Um, version control tools were not designed for tracking data analysis or data science projects. That's simply not what they're for. Um, Git and GitHub are very, very commonly used um, kind of version control tools. Does anyone know why, why Git was created to begin with? It had nothing to do with data science. I think it's like it is for specifically for software engineering. So it has a lot of software engineering -y things, some of which are common with data science projects and some of which have nothing to do with it. So it is incredibly complicated, but there are thankfully tools that actually simplify the, you know, if Git is this big, maybe you can get away with using a small portion of it that could still be very, very effective for doing version control for your data analysis projects. Um, a resource that I would very strongly recommend if you um, do your coding in R is Happy Git with R by Jenny Bryan and Friends. And this is a wonderful kind of online book, if you will. It's a resource um, designed as an online book that actually 
shows you, walks you through the steps of if you work in our studio, how can you effectively use Git and GitHub for a data science project, okay? So it basically abstracts away much of the software engineering aspect of things that would not be relevant and leaves you with just the tools that are actually required for the type of that work that you're doing for data analysis projects. And if that still seems like not a good enough sales pitch, wait a little bit more. I'll talk to you a little bit about how we actually use this for first year undergraduates and how they do it. And I think that that should hopefully be kind of another encouraging factor for you know, much more experienced researchers who probably would have a lot easier time and a lot more background on being able to kind of get up to speed with something like version control. Uh, number seven is automate your process. So we talked about having a readme that maybe tells you about in which order to run your scripts. So at each step of the way, one thing you want to think about is, okay, so now a human wrote that readme that tells me these are this is the order in which I should run my scripts. So that same human is going to have to make sure they run the scripts in that order. How can we take the human out of that equation? Because humans tend to make errors. Humans tend to get phone calls. Humans tend to have personal emergencies where they leave things at a stage, walk away and then come back to it the next day and they might forget. Machine processes don't tend to have that. So what are some ways that you can easily automate your um, kind of data analysis projects so that you can kind of rerun scripts in a maybe particular order, pull files from uh, given places to begin with, and then kind of recreate your analysis results. Especially if your project is a lot more complex than being able to fit in an R markdown file where you can just get away with knitting, um, you want to think about another tool for getting that. A tool that works really well with um, kind of a and data analysis and data science workflow and plays nicely in an R setting as well is Make. So this is a tutorial by Carl Broman called Minimal Make and I have the, I'll give you the link to the slides at the end as well and it's, um, I have the kind of the references at the bottom of these slides. This is the tutorial that I would recommend if you want to kind of learn a little bit about how can I use Make to automate my entire um, kind of data analysis workflow. It truly is minimal in the sense that it gives gives you only what you need and it works kind of beautifully and I haven't I, I don't have a background in software engineering myself and I find this kind of documentation kind of quite um, easy to read through at least not always easy to replicate but you know that you push yourself a little bit and you get there but at least easy to read through and digestible and number eight is share your computing environment, right? And originally we talked about you want to make sure you make your raw data available, you want to make sure you make your code available, and those are actually things you may be able to achieve through something like GitHub. You put your code and your data there and someone else can just clone your project or download your project and they should be good to go, but sometimes they just are not good to go. They get your code, they try to run it in R and doesn't work. Some package is missing. That's an easy fix because you can always install packages pretty easily. Some system library is missing. Okay, that's a little bit more annoying, but you can always install those as well. Maybe a different version of a package was used. So now that's a little bit more of a headache to get an earlier version of a package to be able to, uh, when a new one is released, is not the simplest thing to do that you can do on CRAN, but you can do it. But what if things changed along the way like that? Remember the set seed thing I talked about? What if things change along the way where it simply becomes like quite cumbersome and gets you to the point of giving up because it simply is not possible to reproduce it. So there are tools out there and I think those tools really do kind of vary in their breadth and the technical kind of expertise that may be required to even get started or 
that they are kind of, the, the community that they're designed to serve might be different than what you're doing. So at times they might feel a little bit overkill as well. So three tools that I will mention, one of them is Docker, so you can containerize your uh, project so that actually you're sharing your computing environment as well with the right packages, the right system libraries, right at the versions that you need. Um, I wouldn't say setting one of these up is the easiest thing to do, but I will say that there are many, many great tutorials out there, some specifically designed for working with Docker in a data science context. Another new project is Binder, where you can actually now associate one of these with your GitHub repository, where you can literally have a badge and say, hey, this project also exists on Binder with the compute environment, so instead of cloning it or downloading these files, just click here. It'll take you to a space where you can rerun the analysis. Um, it is a new project. It seems a lot easier kind of getting started than Docker to me, um, but it's also new and I'm not 100% sure kind of where, where it goes in the future, but I'm really encouraged to see kind of steps in this uh, direction where we're lowering the barrier to entry for being able to share the computing environment. Another one that um, was actually um, that I personally have originally started using in a teaching context, but have also been now using for sharing my data analyses is RStudio Cloud, which basically lands you in an RStudio Cloud project with your entire analysis and your data files, and somebody else can reproduce them. Um, if you're going to be sticking around for the workshop later, um, you will have the option, if you like, to use RStudio Cloud to follow along with the project, so that'll give you a sense of I will have my data files and my R Markdown file there, and you should be able to simply log in, click on a link, and hit knit HTML, and actually get the same results that I have, which I think is really, really nice. Um, we recently ran a, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the package Shiny, but it's used for kind of developing web applications and dashboards, and um, we recently ran a Shiny contest on our studio community, and we asked uh, people who are submitting their Shiny apps to also submit an RStudio Cloud link along with it so I could actually recreate each and every one of those submissions and man that was great you know like it's not there's something about reading somebody's code and there's something about actually being able to run somebody's code and being able to do that without copying and pasting and making sure you have the right packages just literally being able to hit run and achieving the same results it's satisfying and it's a great learning experience as well. So we talked about these eight things, and as I said, there's no one-size-fits-all kind of uh, reproducibility um, formula that I can give. It's going to vary, but I think these eight are at least things that should kind of span across disciplines and span across projects and also not necessarily are hugely demanding technically or resource wise to achieve. Now they might be demanding time wise, right? Because if you don't know how to use version control or if you've never done literal programming before or you have collaborators who insist on highlighting rows to indicate certain things and simply that's the, how they're going to give you the data, each and every one of these steps could mean that you're having to spend a little bit more time but the idea is that the, at the end, you actually get a reproducible project. And should you have to go back and reproduce things for another reason, and we all have been there, at least that step becomes a lot easier. Um, there is this uh, really nice paper called Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing, and I really like the title of it because it's not best practices, it's just good enough practices, and that doesn't mean they're bad, that genuinely means they're good enough. Maybe best is sometimes hard to achieve, but these might be easier to achieve. It goes through kind of ten principles for it, so I would strongly recommend reading through it. It's just a few page uh, paper, and it really nicely outlines and expands on some of the principles that I went over as well and gets into a few others. So, in kind of um, wrapping things up, I also want to think about looking into the future. Um, how do we make sure that people are actually able to um, kind of follow these principles, not necessarily having to change their ways mid-career, but kind of getting into things from the beginning and actually following along with the good enough principles. So 
I gave you this quote earlier that said the most important tool is the mindset when starting that the end product will be reproducible. A kind of a follow-up quote to that from Carl Broman is that the second most important tool is training. So I think that this is an, this is, um, an aspect where faculty members and people who run workshops and kind of learning environments actually have a lot that they can do in that space. Um, so I personally think about my um, efforts in reproducibility kind of as a two-pronged approach. First is convincing data scientists to adopt a data analysis work, uh, reproducible data analysis workflow. I feel like maybe that's what we're doing here and maybe I'm not having to convince you, but maybe some of you and I do that when I go out and talk about this stuff a lot where people have their own workflows and what we're asking them to do is just change things a little bit so you can do better, you can be closer to good enough. Um, um, nobody wants to hear that their workflow should be changed though. So this is important work, but hard work. In my opinion, a much more pleasant and perhaps easier work is train new data scientists who don't have any other workflow. If they never copied and pasted an image that they created in R into a Word document, they won't know that that's the way you would work. So um, I am a uh, statistics professor and I teach um, a lot of introductory statistics and data science courses so I feel like my share of the pie when I have my professor hat on is to actually teach data analysis by instilling the best practices in students before actually they set out to do research. So how can we achieve this? Um, the way we achieve this in my intro data science class where they do a lot of kind of data um, analysis projects is the students access the computing environment via the web, which means that they're accessing a cloud environment that already is designed to be the same across the entire class and same with me as well. So they go to the web, they authenticate with their either net ID or something like that, and they get dropped into an R Studio space. So I've tried this a variety of ways. As I mentioned, one of the uh, products I've used is R Studio Cloud, which is actually offered by R Studio and it's free currently for use for educational purposes. We also run our own R Studio server at Duke, so we have another way of getting students into this uh, space as well. But ultimately what's happening is you go to your browser, not to your applications folder, and you land in this R Studio. IDE that was designed for you by your professor to have the right packages, the right versions of the packages and everything you need pre-installed and that it is consistent across all of the students as well. One of the most frustrating things for students is when they, when they hit a point where they're literally running the same code verbatim that you ran but they're getting a different result or they are not getting a result. So this I, this um, cloud-based access to the computing environment basically eliminates that problem. Then they use our markdown, so we actually give them from day one our markdown documents, initially those that have actually been very much pre-populated, a lot of code and prose is already in there and throughout the semester we take that scaffolding away bit by bit. But this is the R Markdown document that I actually give them on day one of class. We use this activity um, using a data set on uh, vote, voting patterns in the United Nations General Assembly and they actually categorize the voting issues in like six um, topics that students tend to know something about like nuclear weapons or the Palestinian conflict and whatnot and you really can see how for example the US votes compared to Turkey which is where I'm originally from so we build this visualization with them we ask them to change the country's names knit the document again and basically they get to see a lot of code than what we're asking them to learn on that day but they actually get to interact with it and build their first visualization and what they see is a literate programming environment that is in a computing space that we have provided for them. So this stuff becomes second nature to them by the time they finish their introductory course. Then what they do when they're done with things is they actually use uh, Git for version control and push their work to GitHub and that's where we do the evaluation of their work and we provide feedback. How do we actually teach our, our markdown 
and get to students who have no background in programming. We do it little by little and we do it by making sure that class time is allocated to each of these steps. So we don't just assume they're going to learn Git on their own, but we just actually walk them through the process and because they're using the RStudio ID for working with Git, they're really doing only a few things, Git pull, Git push, commits, and that's kind of about it. When they work in uh, teams, they do some merge conflicts and we walk them through that as well. But again, it's a very kind of small slice of the entire Git pie, but it is one that will enable them to kind of be able to learn more in future classes. Um, I have in the past taught this class without the version con control aspect of it and I've always told myself, you know what, next week we'll introduce it. No, 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 next week we'll introduce it and it just never felt like the right time because it seemed like it was going to be this huge thing that we're throwing at them. And what I've found to be the best way to go is to do all of this on day one and then bit by bit take away the scaffolding and teach them a little bit more. Um, the idea is to give them the full story and say this is a full data analysis pipeline as opposed to saying today I'm teaching you R and tomorrow I'm going to teach you something completely irrelevant. So that's kind of all I have to say about reproducibility. I hope that I've been able to kind of communicate both some things that I hope we all can adopt and kind of like integrate into our work. And as you, if you also are involved in training the new generation to think about how can I embed some of this into my teaching um, in a way that's not going to overwhelm the students, but also show them that no, this is a part of being a data analyst, of being a data scientist, being a statistician. It is not just about fitting a model and finding a p-value, but it is about the entire pipeline. And hopefully if we can teach them to the new students, by the time they become graduate students, there will be no further need for training. That's not true. There will be new technology. But at least they will be used to the idea of doing their work reproducibly, which I think will be a huge benefit. Um, the slides are at this link and as I said there are the links to the kind of some of the citations that I mentioned along the way so if you're interested in them you can grab them there. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are. Yeah? yeah. Um, so I guess I'm just interested in, in uh, ways of convincing people that are not the students um, that, that's actually where we struggle a lot is trying to, to come in midstream. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate you know the, the slides and, and this is very familiar to what we teach in our workshops. But do you have some thoughts about that? Or so so convincing them for what, what specifically? The, to really value these these best practices and to um, to even though they're I mean like I would say that you know the the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago, but the next best time sure. is right now. Right. right. So somebody who's you know been in the research for 10 years, maybe doesn't have these practices, mm -hmm. you'd like to really encourage them. Um, they, you know, it's all oh, I'm too old to change my ways, whatever, but no, right. it's like today's the day to get started. Yeah. And yeah, so I think that, um, I think there are two, two ways of doing this, and I think uh, maybe on your end, you're able to do one, and I think journals and whatnot are hopefully doing more of the other, right? Mm -hmm. There is a move towards requiring people to submit fully reproducible documents for publication. That's not completely, you know, accepted by all journals, but there is at least that move, and I think that's indicative of something. And I would be quite surprised if journals started to take steps back from it and say, no, actually, we're not going to care about reproducibility. I think if any, if movement is going to happen, it's going to be forwards movement. So I think in that case, um, researchers are going to realize, hey, maybe I do really need to kind of pick up these new skills because this is what is expected of me as a scientist right now. The second thing is, I think, about this idea of perhaps the good enough practices. Maybe being able to work with a particular scientist and say, now, if they truly don't believe reproducibility is important, hopefully, I mean, hopefully that's not the case. But I think most often what's happening is, yeah, of course, in my heart I know it's important, but really, 
I have a zillion things to do and I need to get this out the door and I'm not wanting to add a whole lot onto my plate right now and I think that's a very understandable position. I think working with these um, researchers kind of one-on-one -on -one and trying to plan out, okay, in your workflow, where are obvious things we can tackle? Where are things we can really help you that would maybe require not so much um, time commitment on your end to learn a completely new skill, like the folder organization thing we talked about, and read me. like, these are going to be things that are a little bit easier to achieve than asking someone to completely change the language they work with or use version control if they've never done so. So I think doing them in kind of small pieces and also just acknowledging that, hey, you've checked off one of those 10 principles of good enough practices, you know, that's still a win, is important. Obviously, we want to keep pushing it. Um, and then I think maybe the third thing is technology helping things. So I talked about being able to teach, get to first year undergraduates who have no background in programming. The only way I know how to do that, and I think many other colleagues who are doing this know how to do that, is with the right IDE that the students are working in that abstracts away some of the things. We're not dropping them into a bare terminal shell all of a sudden and starting with Git in it, right? That would be really hard to achieve all of that. So the third thing is the technology helping. We also talked about, I mentioned like from Docker to Binder that seemed like, you know, maybe Docker to me at least felt a little bit more like, man, I wish I knew a little bit more software engineering and Binder doesn't feel like that as much. And I'm sure there will be the next thing as well. So being able to figure out technically where these colleagues are and helping them find the right technological tool that will ease them into this space is probably the third thing that we can do. And technological advancements are happening. Um, they're happening faster than I get to learn about them, to be honest. So kind of being on it and reading about it, um, I think is, and then disseminating that information is really valuable. I think one follow-up, I would add maybe a fourth point, and maybe it's highlighted by your GitHub um, involvement, your Twitter, that um, researchers increase their impact by, by doing these practices and by um, giving things like DOIs to their content. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And, and you know, one other thing is that Git is useful for version control, which is important for reproducibility. But then once you put your work out there on GitHub, that's, that actually has other um, pluses for the researcher in terms of self-promotion and collaboration opportunities. So it comes with these additional things that go beyond the science itself but can be incredibly impactful for one's career. And hopefully those are also additional kind of carrots to give. Do you yeah. think that, sorry, do you think that R2 is going to, uh, how do you say that, to a payment service? Because each time that I see that R2 put a brick, puts a brick in that direction, like the cloud service, like the, the, the other server, the pro version of the server that you can install by your own. Mm -hmm. um, obviously in some way I'm worried to see that because it's like taking other direction like our studio ID is never going to be a product that is going to be a paid product. That is simply not in the mission of the company. The open source packages that our studio funds, like the entire Tidyverse and Shiny, those are never going to be paid products either. Um, the pro products often have a non-pro version, so there's an RStudio server that is free, that is open source. The RStudio server pro is something that you pay for. Although, as an academic, there are discounts that you can get. So if you're using it for teaching purposes, it's free. And if you're using it for te uh, research purposes, it is a discounted rate. So there are academic discounts on it. But the main product itself, the IDE, is never going to be a paid product. Our Studio Cloud, which is another service that I mentioned that is currently free for academic use, um, or actually currently free for any sort of use, I believe, um, I think that will at some point have a pay structure uh, in order to be able to make sure that it has the right kind of backend to be able to sustain the compute that it needs. I'm unfortunately not sure about the payment structure itself because the product is still in alpha. So I think the engineers are testing things out to find like 
waiting until, okay, this is a product we can actually now put out there. Um, so that, that's a different story, but the ID itself is never going to be a paid product. Yeah. We have time for maybe one more question. So, so I, have a, I have a very quick one. Mm -hmm. um, I love the structure of like the kind of the workflow and everything. Um, I, I have a hard time, so once you're done with your project, you have your paper, let's say, written in markdown. Mm -hmm. How willing have you seen journals to accept markdowns as the final product? And is that transitioning over time? Because I see a lot of things where you're like, you have this beautiful file structure, and then once you're starting the review process, you have subfolders and versions and problems with like a Word document or something more traditional. Um, so the review process is, I think, a tricky one if you're talking about could someone actually leave comments? Like, like is, is that, that the question? question? Well, just, no. Are they accepting markdowns? Like, are all journals going towards now where they're accepting markdowns instead of the ubiquitous Microsoft Word? Right. Um, I don't know for a fact that all, like, there are some journals that do. That's definitely not true for all. For much of the journals that I have interacted with, they accept PDF. So what I, the workflow there is using the right LaTeX style file and building on Knitter under the hood. You still write everything in our markdown as we've shown. You just happen to pull in that LaTeX style file and the result is the, what the journal expects as well. Um, so if, if the journal wants a Microsoft Word file specifically and not a PDF, you can write to Word um, from our markdown actually, so you can always export it out. Now the tricky thing is if somebody does like edits on a Word document, there's no way to back import them programmatically into an R Markdown document. So there is a human like step there that would transcribe those changes. And my recommendation at that stage would be to maybe make a static version of that Word document that got highlighted and stuff, put that into the repository, make all of the relevant edits in one or a series of comment commits that are kind of specifically tagged for it. So it is possible to at least like backlink them to each other, um, but there's not a good way of currently getting comments on a Word document back into an Art Markdown document. But exporting out is easy enough. And there's been some advancements in that export space, I think, right now that the Word output is looking pretty slick. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, uh, everyone, please thank our presenter again. Thank, thank you. you.